Forget your canned goods that morning. You can bring them that night. It's an honor to have serving us here at the POA, Pastor Ryan Franklin. Wouldn't want to do it without him. Angie, they're awesome. Love you to death. Come on, Pastor Ryan, deliver the word. Thank you, Pastor. Such an honor to be with you tonight. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. If you have your Bibles, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. It's great to be in church with you tonight, to see all of your smiling faces. It's, all, it, it's always a good time to be with you. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Turn to your neighbor and say, as thyself. Again, thank you so much for being in church tonight. You're just, I mean, you can be seated. You can be seated. <laughs> I always wanted to do that. This past Sunday, Pastor Gentry did such a phenomenal job of sharing God's greatest gift to us. And through prayer and through processing what I would teach you tonight, once again the Lord has given me a word that is sort of in cadence with Pastor Gentry's message. He did this the same thing last time. His Sunday message was uh, in cadence with, with my Wednesday message. And, and as he mentioned, God's greatest gift to us is absolutely the gift of salvation. It's redemption from the sin in our life. And tonight, I want to present a different sort of gift to you. I want to talk about a subject that I've been wrestling with for several months, most of this year, and because I don't believe that a, that a person needs to stop at that gift of salvation. When we repent and we're filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and we're covered by the gift of his blood through baptism in Jesus' name. Yes, that is the greatest gift, but I don't believe that's the end of the gift. We shouldn't stop there. There's greater gifts within that gift to uncover. In fact, Scripture calls us to move on to maturity within ourselves and within the kingdom of God. And so let's consider our text tonight, and let's begin to unwrap this other gift that I'm talking about. Now, obviously, these great commandment verses that, that we started with, they're very common verses. In fact, sometimes a scripture this common and this familiar to us can lead us to sort of tune out some of the revelation within it. And we sort of get desensitized to all that's in it. But it's amazing how the Scripture in general usually has much more to gain than what we can see at first glance. And so the last two words of this Scripture, as thyself, is what I want to focus on with you tonight. And I want to title my message, Unwrapping the Gift of Loving Myself. Unwrapping the gift of loving myself. We're going to unwrap that gift together tonight. Would that be okay? Have you ever had a gift that was really hard to unwrap? Maybe it had too much boxing tape around it and you just couldn't get into it. Maybe it had uh, that, that really hard plastic that's like sealed on the edges and and it's almost impossible to get, get the gift out. You, you definitely have to have a pocket knife to get it. You know, I've been there before. And to be honest with you, I've really struggled with unwrapping this particular gift over the years. Even recently, but, but through studying it more this year, I feel like that I have a ton more clarity because I've done the hard work to sort of unwrap this gift. 
And I've worked hard to understand how to love myself better and more biblically. And so our text says to love thy neighbor as thyself. And so I'd like for you to turn to your neighbor and just ask him or her, what does love thy neighbor as thyself mean to you? I'll give you about 30 seconds for a quick answer. Some of you have some funny things to say about it, I guess. Hear a little giggling. Name a few things. Blake? Name something. You didn't, you didn't ask her, did you? <laughs> Somebody call out something. What is loving thyself, loving your neighbor as yourself, what does that mean to you? Hello? If you have, Sister Mangan said, if, if you have candy and she wants some, you'll give it to her. I like it. I like it. Anybody else? You're right about that. I'm surprised. Okay. Very good. Very good. Love and give without expecting it back. You know, most of the time, uh, and, and I would assume that you're just being bashful here because I, I would think that you probably have more answers than this, right? Maybe I should have warmed you up a little bit more. Most of the time, we, we think of this as the fact that, that we want to treat others the way that we want to be treated, right? And it's kindness Maybe it's providing for our physical needs, feeding ourselves, roof over our head, good job that provides for our family. Uh, we love to consider the outward components of our needs and others and the things that we can see. And many times we sometimes neglect those inner components that Scripture speaks to so heavily. And in my years of experience with working with people as a pastor and, and even before, I've, I've often experienced a mixture of emotion for the way that I see people thinking of themselves and others, especially in the church world. You know, on one hand, I have admiration for people in the church because of how selfless and compassionate that they are towards others. Many of you in here are so selfless. You're so compassionate towards others. And then sometimes I feel a little bit sad, that mixed emotion, because of how they'll, they're often unable to show the same qualities of love towards themselves. And many times we're good at exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit to others around us. And then we struggle to receive that fruit of the Spirit in our own lives. And as I was processing all of this this year, and I was thinking to myself, why? Why does it seem to me that, that Christians are so much quicker to give to others, to love others, instead of giving to and, and loving themselves? And the biggest reason that I could think of is that, that there's sort of a, a messed up mindset on this topic. There's a sense that, that others deserve compassion and patience and, and long-suffering, but, but applying that to myself is just considered in many of our minds to be a little bit selfish. Maybe there's some guilt associated with caring for ourselves, or, or maybe it feels like if, if we truly love ourselves. Maybe it's going to somehow get in the way of what the Lord wants to do in my life for others. And so consequently, as Christians, we often love others at the expense of not loving ourselves. And here's what I think causes this. A ton of things are done these days 
in the name of self-love. And actually, there's a, there's a whole self-love movement out there. It's probably one of the largest and, and one of the most prevalent movements, movements among the younger generations across the world today. And there's a physician that defines self-love as this, the state of appreciation for oneself that grows from actions that support our physical, psychological, and spiritual growth. And then he goes on to say that that self-love means having a high regard for your own well-being and happiness, taking care of your own needs and not sacrificing your own your, your own well-being to please others. Now, this sort, this, this sort of sounds good if you just breeze by those details. And, and I do think that we do need to take care of ourselves. Don't get me wrong here. We need to treat ourselves kindly. But, but when I look at the end result of his definition, and I didn't name his name on purpose, but when I look at, at the end result of what he was saying in that passage that he wrote, as a Christian, I can't help but to feel troubled by the end goal of this type of self-love. And the main problem with this definition and others is that they're saying that self-love is considered to be the foundation that leads to all the other good things that we want in life. And so in other words, self-love, according to this worldly definition, promises that, that we will be more content and we'll be more confident and we'll even be more free if we just embrace loving ourselves. But here's the problem with that. Here's the problem that I have with that. As Christians, I know that Christ is the foundation for my contentment. I know that he is the foundation for my, for my confidence and my freedom. And I know that we can't achieve those things in life with self-love alone. And we can only truly achieve those things through Christ, through our relationship with Christ. And, and I would say that the reason we abandon loving ourselves as we need to as a, as a Christian is often because that self-love movement tries to replace Christ as our source and foundation. And the self-love movement teaches that if you love yourself better, you'll find some magical fulfillment in life. And I really think that, that that holds many of us Christians back from truly loving ourselves as we should love ourselves. Because we know that this replacement of Christ's thought process, we know it just really isn't true, right? And this will hold many of us back from embracing the biblical concept of loving ourselves. Now, it is, in fact, pretty natural for us to love ourselves. I want you to listen to this scripture, Ephesians 5, 29. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. So the scripture assumes that it's going to be natural for us to love ourselves, even as the Lord loves the church. And maybe this is why the, the second of the two greatest commandments in the Word of God tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so Jesus is telling us to love and care for others as we would love and care for ourselves. And, and I think it's pretty natural for us to care for ourselves to some extent. And Jesus is telling us to seek the well-being of others as we would seek our own well-being. But even though Scripture sort of assumes this, I think people still are challenged with loving and caring for themselves in, in particular ways and, and, in, and in particular times. And so I want to consider this next question. What's the, when you think about your life, 
What's the biggest challenge that you personally experience when it comes to loving yourself? Think about that in your own life. What's the biggest challenge that you personally experience when it comes to loving yourself? So now let's take a look at this with Scripture. Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. John 3.30, he must increase, but I must decrease. Scripture is, is very clear that we're called to put God and others ahead of our own lives. We're called to glorify God and, and humble ourselves. In fact, 2 Timothy takes this even further, and this, this, this one really gets people sometimes. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And we are here, we're here, folks. December, Christmas time of 2023, we're in perilous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now I'm going here, I'm going somewhere with this. So just stay with me. But the Greek meaning for lovers of self in this scripture means selfish. It means overly fond or, or, or self of self or, or too intent on one's self-interest. And the Bible actually tells us to turn away from those. Turn away from those types of people. But I don't think the Lord is telling us to not love and care for ourselves here. In fact, he says to love others, right, as thyself. And so I really think that our mindset, and, and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm driving towards tonight, if you're wondering. Our mindset on this subject has to be right first. And here's what I've come to the conclusion of. Our mindset with loving ourselves should be this. Are you ready? How can I love and care for myself in a way that best enables me to, number one, love and serve God? And number two, how can I love and care for myself in a way that best enables me to love and, and serve others? And so it's not loving ourselves for the sole purpose of our own happiness and our own enjoyment in life, those things are going to come. They're absolutely going to come. But that's not the ultimate purpose. In other words, in my physical and my mental and, and, and emotional and spiritual health, is it in a place that positions me to love and serve God and others in the best possible way? Am I mature enough to take care of myself in a way that I can love and serve God and others in the best possible way? And if it's not, then what does that look like for my life? And how can I get there? How can I love myself with a biblical perspective in mind? And that prepares me to love and serve God and others the way that I'm called to love and serve others. And so what I'm seeing in our opening text is that we are called to love ourselves equally to how we love others and vice versa. 
I want you to think about this. After the two greatest commandments in Matthew 20, 20, 22, you've got verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Galatians 5, 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so if all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments and, and the law is even fulfilled through this commandment, then it should be a significant reminder that, that we're called to radically love not only God, not only our neighbor, but also to radically love ourselves as well. So how in the world do we do that? My goodness. Well, that's part two next time. Y'all have a good night. No. <clears throat> we can do an entire series on this. I, I've even taught pieces of every bit of this at various times. But I want to give you a broad picture of what I think loving ourselves looks like with a, with a biblical perspective in mind. Would that be okay? So if you have a a, a pen and paper or, or you want to do it on your phone, uh, I would encourage you to take notes. I've got eight steps here uh, of loving yourself. First thing is lean on Jesus. First and foremost, lean on Jesus. This is, this is first. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that, are la that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That sounds good, doesn't it? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think it's a given, but, but sometimes it's not really a given, is it? We have to come unto him, and we have to lean on him, and we, and we have to let his burdens become our burdens. And, and sometimes we... We sort of seem to take on our own burdens, right? And we take on weights that, that were not in his plan and are, and are not necessarily healthy for us. They, they may even be good things, but they're not what's best for us. And it's important from time to time that we sort of check ourselves and, and make sure that we're carrying his burdens. And it's amazing how that, that, that'll bring a sense of rest to our souls. It brings a supernatural rest when we learn to truly lean on Jesus. And so lean on Jesus, and that's our first step to loving ourselves. Step two, you have to release self-doubt. Release self-doubt. Psalms 139, 13 through 14 says, For thou hast Possess my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's room. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. From your mother's womb, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And here's the bottom line if you're breathing right now, and I hope you all are, <clears throat> then you have amazing value in the kingdom of God. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you're listening to me right now, you are God's creation. And somehow, some way, you've got to fight off those, those negative voices that are, that are telling you that there's something wrong with how God made you. And I know these things go through most of your heads because I, I hear them myself. Listen to me right now. There is nothing wrong with how God made you. Now, now I get it. I've probably felt insecure more days of my life than I have felt secure. And I would imagine that's probably reality for most of us. But I've also done a ton of hard work to convince myself that God does make amazing things. 
And to do this, I've had to go to Scripture often to remind myself that I was not a mistake and, and that he formed me perfectly. And if we really trust the Word of God, and, 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 and we've got to stop allowing society to dictate our standards of, of beauty and to believe that what Scripture says about me really is true. And verses like Genesis 1, 31 are true when he said God saw everything that he had made and, and behold, it was very good. You see, God's creation isn't just good. According to this scripture, it's very good. And even when he made me, even when he made you, he made a very good thing. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. And, and it's important for me to remember that everything that God made is beautiful. There really isn't anything about me that I have to hide. He made me. And he made you. And we are very good and beautiful. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and each of you have incredible value to him and to the kingdom of God. And when you know exactly who you are in Christ, it makes you free to release the self-doubt and free to love yourself in a healthy and a biblical way. And then we are free to move on to step three. You have to build self-compassion. Now, this is, more comp this is a, a, a more complicated step. There's, there's a lot to this one. In fact, the next few will, will uh, be in line with this. But Colossians 3.12 says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And so we're supposed to clothe ourselves with compassion, with both inwardly, and outwardly, meaning for others, but also for ourselves. And self-compassion, is, is, it's, it's a big one and includes a ton of things. But one of the most significant things is that self-compassion allows you to love yourself enough to move on to this step four, establish healthy boundaries. Establish healthy boundaries in your life and this is so hard, so hard for most people. I can't tell you how many conversations in a week that I have about healthy boundaries. And because when I'm self-compassionate, then I'm free to protect myself with boundaries from people who may not have my best interest in mind. And you have to understand that just because we love someone, I, there's people in my life that I love deeply, but just because we love someone doesn't mean that that person should have free reign with anything in our lives. Listen to this scripture, Proverbs 25, 17. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee, and so hate thee. In other words, there's a boundary where one person's property line ends and another person's property line begins. And that's a principle of all things in our lives, including and especially emotional things. It's super important that, that we have respect for others, but we also have the right to, for others to respect us. And I'm not going to get into the intricate details of boundaries tonight, but basically healthy boundaries allow you to have your own voice and to make your own choices and, and still allowing others to have their own voice and make their own choices. Not allowing someone to, to own my own decisions and, and sometimes even more importantly, not allowing myself to own someone else's decisions. A person with boundaries can say no when it's needed. And even confront people in appropriate and healthy and caring ways. You see, God created you in his image with the ability to freely make choices. 
and establish boundaries for your life. And if you find yourself struggling with boundaries as you're, as you're working on self-compassion, there's no doubt in my mind that the Lord can and will restore this area of your character and can help you begin moving towards loving yourself in a much greater way. And it can be done within the context of love. Because even though we may need to say no sometimes, or we may need to set other boundaries with someone, it doesn't mean that we don't love those people. In fact, the act of setting boundaries actually makes sure that we can continue to love and serve people the way that we need to. Boundaries are a very important part of, a, of healthily loving others, but it's really an important part of self-compassion and loving ourselves. And also as, as a continuation of self-compassion is number five, step five, learning to forgive yourself. Learning to forgive yourself. And unfortunately, for forgiveness can be one of the hardest things that, that you and I have to do on our journey to loving ourselves. But if we hold on to things like hurt and pain and resentment and and anger, even if we are the cause of that, and we're blaming ourselves, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't do, it, it, it eats us emotionally and even spiritually on the inside. And, and this is actually one of the primary tactics of the enemy. And here's what I need you to, to grab hold of today. If you're struggling in this area, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, but, but behold, all things are become new. And when we can work to embrace forgiveness of ourselves, it frees us to be able to live in the present with a newness of life. Can you raise your hand if you've ever messed up before? There's a couple of you that haven't. <clears throat> you just messed up. <laughs> you see, every one of us have made mistakes. And at times, we've even intentionally taken the wrong path, intentionally. We're all guilty of that. But God's love for us is overwhelming. And it absolutely covers a multitude of error. And so give yourself some self-compassion and forgive yourself and begin releasing those things that are holding you back. Step six, which is also a continuation of self-compassion, is not requiring unnecessary things of yourself. In other words, honor your limitations. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have limitations. You see, we've got to learn to experience loss and failure and weakness and limits and still keep a sense of love for ourselves. That's true self-compassion. That's true self-love. And it's impossible for me to be, be all things to all people. And so I know my limits. And guess what? I'm okay with my limits. We have to embrace the fact that, that we're fallen and we're weak. And we have to realize that it's through our relationship with Christ that we become strong. And we're created in the image of God. And because of that, we have significant value and strength even in our weakness. In other words, we can be weak and strong at the same time. I'm a fallible human being. I can only do so much and then I reach my limits. And it's when we embrace the reality of honoring our limits that we're giving ourselves the needed self-compassion and this is truly loving ourselves. Step seven, allow people to draw close and love you back. Now, this is going to get a lot of you. 
Allow people to draw close and love you back. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. We're actually showing that we love ourselves when we allow others to come in and love us back. And this is harder than you think. You see, we can't just give to other people. And I'm, and I'm facing, I'm looking into an audience of people that just give, give, give. We have to receive from our relationships as well. And we have to be aware of our need for those relational nutrients in our life. And we have to be able to ask for those things, those needs to be met by someone else in our lives. They're not just going to read our mind. It's very difficult. This is a very difficult thing, but it's, but it's very much needed. And that's truly loving ourselves. Those things are all a major part of giving us the ability to truly love ourselves. And then our eighth and our final step to loving yourself, this is where all of, these, all of the, this lesson sort of comes together. You have to work to grow your capacity. Grow your capacity. Genesis 127 tells us, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We were created in the image of God. And if we're going to function in the image of God, then we have to be willing to walk in the authority and the dominion that the Lord has given us in our own lives. And this includes being able to step up and, and do all that he asks of us. And I want to encourage you here. God has, has either equipped you or he will equip you for whatever he has called you to do. And the Lord has never called a single person to something that he hasn't prepared them for. And when we embrace this call and responsibility, then that, that's when we're truly able to submit and to love and serve God and others in healthy and productive ways. And so expanding and growing your capacity is a huge, it's a huge part of loving yourself, which is a huge part of being able to effectively love God and love others. Number one, lean on Jesus. Number two, release self-doubt. Number three, build self-compassion. Number four, establish healthy boundaries. Number five, learn to forgive yourself. Number six, respect your limits. Number seven, allow people to draw close and, and love you back. And finally, grow your capacity. Now, as I bring this to a close, we, we started with the verses, love God and love your neighbor as thyself. And I just want to say this. I believe that your ability to love God and love your neighbor in a healthy way in a biblical way, it's directly proportional to your ability to love yourself. I'm going to say that again. I believe that your ability to love God and love your neighbor in a healthy and a biblical way is directly proportional to your ability to love yourself. And if you're not seeing the good and the positive things that that you'd like to see in your life regarding how you're loving and serving God and how you're loving and serving others in your life, then ultimately, I would question as to whether or not you're truly loving yourself the way that you could. And this is not a statement to make you feel guilty. It's not a statement to make you feel less than but it is a statement that I hope will challenge you to pursue loving yourself even more, to pursue growth in the area of loving yourself. 
And if you're wanting to pursue this sort of growth and loving yourself, why don't we all stand and we're just going to make our way to the altar as we normally do on a Wednesday night. We're just going to go, go home by way of the altar tonight. If you can all just join me just for a few moments. I'm not going to hold you long. I want you to think about this as you're walking forward. Luke 4.18 tells us that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I'm called to be a part of that. And when the Lord speaks of healing the brokenhearted and and delivering the captives and and giving sight to the blind and and setting at liberty those who are bruised, the, the Lord is speaking of a spiritual and an emotional healing for others that I'm going to be a part of. This is a great gift to others. But here's the deal. And this is what I need you to get tonight. He's not going to leave you out. He's speaking of this same gift for you as well. And in this Christmas season, this only comes through unwrapping the gift of loving yourself in a biblical way. And when you learn to love yourself properly, it's It's not for some selfish or some self-gratifying reason. You're loving yourself in a biblical way to prepare yourself, to prepare yourself to be able to love God and love others the way that we're called and commanded to do. If you believe that, why don't you stretch your your hands forth right now to, to the Lord. And I want you to begin to ask the Lord to help you unwrap that tonight. To help you unwrap the gift of loving yourself tonight. Just talk to him for just a minute. Lift your voices right now. Right now, Lord. Jesus, I want to learn to love myself the way that you desire for me to love myself, Jesus, so that I can be more productive in your kingdom, so that I can love you the way that I need to love you, and I can love others the way that I need to love them. Help me to embrace that, Lord. And if there's areas, if there's, if there's one of these eight that I'm struggling with, Lord, I pray, Jesus, that, that you would bring that to my attention right now, Lord. And I pray, Jesus, that you would begin to order my steps and, and order my path, Lord, so that I can begin to grow in that particular area, Jesus, so that I can love myself in a biblical way. I love you, Jesus. Real quick, before we go, why don't you reach over to somebody next to you. Just lay your hand on their shoulder. Or I want you to pray for them right now. so much for joining us today. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. We love you, 
Jesus. We love you, Jesus. 